nice and tight, and then turn your fist around. And it goes away. And the reason is, is that when your arm's facing this way, your arm is pronated or supinated? It's supinated. Pronated. And when it's supinated, your hand, is, your bicep brachii is strong. <laughs> and when it's not, <laughs> when it's not, when it's when it's pronated, you end up uh, losing the ability for the the, doesn't, uh, the radial tuberosity no longer faces the right direction for your biceps brachii to pull. Whereas this process, the coronoid process, that coronoid process doesn't move at all, and that's why the brachialis, which attaches to the coronoid, uh, sorry, the coronoid process of the ulna. It doesn't care which way your hand is facing. So the brachialis muscle always works, but the biceps don't work if your hand is pronated. Does that make sense? Uh, so then the forearm, and here's where we learn four minus one equals three. There are eight muscles of the anterior forearm. Four superficial, one in the middle, and three deep. The four on top are pass, fail, pass, fail. Okay? Put your thumb on your medial epicondyle, put your other fingers all the way across your arm, and say pass, fail, pass, fail. The first finger, pass, pronator, teres. Okay, the pronator teres reaches over, grabs hold of the radius, and pulls on it, which causes the radius to flip over, right? It's got that annulus, the uh, annular ligament that goes around the head of the radius here, and it's like got it in a headlock, so that it can't get out, up or down. So all it can do is spin. In babies, they don't have a head, so it can slip out, which is that thing he was talking about, about um, the uh, toddlers uh, who get their arm pulled out of that, that ligament, that annular ligament. So uh, once you get a, uh, the head of the radius on there, that doesn't happen anymore. The annular ligament is there. But one other thing I want you to notice is the hand is attached to the radius. So if you attach any muscle to the radius, that muscle is going to cause either pronation or supination. It has to. Whereas the ulna doesn't rotate. So there's no pronation or supination. So hand is connected to the radius. Radius is connected to the ulna. The ulna makes the elbow joint. Sometimes. So, the four muscles are pronator teres, that one goes to the radius. Then, fail is flexor carpi radialis. Flexor, because it attaches here. Carpi attaches to one of your carpal bones. Radialis because it's on the thumb side. So it causes flexion and radial deviation. Flexion and radial deviation. Then there's pass, the next one. Pass is palmaris longus. Palmaris longus goes from the medial epicondyle and goes all the way down to the pad of the hand, with the palmar surface, that upside down triangle of hand, and pulls on it. And you can make it pop out sometimes like that because the palmaris longus is the only muscle in the anterior forearm that does not go through the carpal tunnel. Okay, it does not go through that groove in your hand there where all the other tendons go through because it stops at the palm. So there's no need to keep it from doing a bowstringing effect, right? So the palmaris longus, some people don't even have it because its job is to pull on the pad of the hand and we're finger people. We use our fingers to grab things, and so uh, our palms are no longer really long. That makes the difference for the palmaris longus. And the last one is fail. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor comes from the medial epicondyle. Carpi goes to a carpal bone in the wrist, so it doesn't move the fingers. And then ulnaris on the ulnar side, so it causes flexion of the wrist and ulnar deviation. Okay, which is medial deviation. So that's the four superficial. Pass, fail, pass, fail. Pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. The one in the middle is flexor digitorum superficialis, the girly fist. Okay, because you don't, no one would hit anybody with a fist like that. And the flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor, 
comes from here, medial epicondyle. Digitorum goes to the, all four digits of the hand, or the last four digits of the hand, but only goes to the middle phalanx of each finger. And because it does that, cannot curl, curl the ends of the fingers. And so the only thing it can do is close your hand like this, okay, with your fingers still straight. And that is flexor digitorum superficialis. The next three muscles are a real fist, okay? They are flexor digitorum profundus. Profundus, the deep one, goes all the way to the tips of the last four digits and makes you curl your fingers all the way up. The next one is flexor pollicis longus, goes to the tip of the thumb and makes the thumb curl, curve all the way up. And then the last thing, pronating it so I can pop you one, is pronator quadratus. <laughs> right here across the bottom of the wrist. It's the most deep of all of these muscles. Runs right across the wrist and goes from the ulna to the radius and causes it to flip over. Okay, so that's all of the muscles of the anterior forearm. The eight muscles of the anterior forearm. Pronator teres. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Sorry, flexor carpi radialis. Flexor uh, the uh, pulmaris longus. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor digitorum superficialis. Flexor digitorum profundus flexor pollicis longus, and pronator quadratus right here. Now on the back of the arm, I drew my, my little six dots. And the six dots I draw are here, 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 and here. Okay? And you can pretty sure you can put this on your arm in the test. I'm not sure. So here, brachioradialis. Brachioradialis, all of these muscles are all going to come from the extensor side. All of these muscles, all 12 of them are all radial nerve. Okay, so brachioradialis causes flexion of the elbow when the hand is pronated. So right when you turn off the biceps, you turn on the brachioradialis, which is why pull-ups are harder than chin-ups. When you do chin-ups, you get to use your biceps. When you do pull-ups, you've turned your biceps off and you're now using your brachioradialis muscle. So brachioradialis causes flexion of the elbow. The next one, the next two we learn together, and I make you make the two. Remember, they don't go to your fingers. They are the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. The long one goes to the short finger, the short one goes to the long finger. They're named that because the distance from the lateral epicondyle to the back of your hand there is longer to the second digit than it is to the third digit, okay? Extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Don't move the fingers at all. They cause extension of the wrist and radial deviation, okay? Extension of the wrist, radial deviation. That was one, two, three, now four. Put all four fingers out. Extensor digitorum, no other numbers, just extensor digitorum. Okay, it goes to all four fingers of the hand, grabs the extensor expansion of each one of the fingers. On the back of the hand, you just have an extensor hood, and that hood, no matter what muscles attach to it, make your fingers do that. So the extensor indices, it just attaches to the extensor hood and makes that happen. The lumbricals, they make that happen. And the extensor digitorum, it also makes that happen, just for those four fingers. So that's four, then five. Extensor digiti minimi. And the last one here, extensor carpi ulnaris. It causes extension of the wrist and ulnar deviation. Okay, extension of the wrist, ulnar deviation. That's the order of these muscles around the forearm. So the first muscle you'll find, brachioradialis. The next muscles are extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. The next muscle is extensor digitorum. The next muscle, extensor digiti minimi. The next muscle, extensor carpi ulnaris. Then, the six muscles that go down the arm, they are anconius, the supinator, the snuff box, and the indices. So, that you just have to know. Anconius, supinator, snuff box, and indices. Anconius is right here, just past the elbow on the lateral side. If you extend very hard and try to keep your hand very um, relaxed, you'll feel a tightness right there at the elbow joint as you extend your arm, and that is anconius. Then there's the supinator, okay? The supinator grabs hold of the radius in the exact same place that the pronator teres does. 
pronator teres pulls one way, supinator pulls the other way. Pronation, supination, pronation, supination. When you go and look in the lab and find the pronator teres, you can dig around the other side of the muscle and you'll find the supinator on the other side. Okay? Then the snuff box, the anatomical snuff box. It's a brevis sandwich, right? Brevis sandwich. The brevis is in the middle. And the brevis has to be on the bottom, and the brevis has to be with the abductor pollicis because both of them only go to the first phalanx of the thumb. One causing abduction, the abductor pollicis longus, and the other one causing extension of the thumb, but only the first phalanx. It can't do that. That's what the top of the snuff box is for. The top of the snuff box is extensor pollicis longus. And then the last one is extensor indices, okay, which only causes extension of the finger. And this is the order you will find these as you go down the arm. Now, because these deep muscles become superficial in the snuff box, the order will actually be as you go around the arm, you'll see the um, brachioradialis, the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and then the snuff box will come out through them and make this the snuff box. And then on the other side will be extensor digitorum. Okay? And then there was those six tunnels that he talked about across the arm. It uses those six tunnels for the snuff box to make the top of the snuff box be so far away over in the corner. Because the first part is the abductor and the uh, extensor brevis. And then is the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis out of the second tunnel. And in the third tunnel is the extensor pollicis longus. So it has to go past those and then hook back over to the thumb. 